In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, what a week it has been. On Sunday, many of us watched a Super Bowl of which we didn't necessarily care about the outcome, but certainly had opinions about the halftime performance. After Bethel class on Monday, I rushed home to discover that there would be no report of the Iowa Democratic caucuses due to a malfunctioning computer app. And thanks to a reminder from my wife, I tuned into the State of the Union address where I watched Speaker Pelosi ruthlessly tear up the president's speech on Tuesday night. On Wednesday, I paid close attention to the Senate impeachment vote. On Thursday morning, President Trump questioned a keynote speaker at the National Prayer Breakfast who quoted Jesus' command in Matthew 5, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And while all of that was happening in the political and social spheres of our country, I was preparing for a funeral, a funeral for a faithful longtime member of this congregation. And at that, fun at that funeral, I never once mentioned the divisive politics of our time. I did not need to applaud the Speaker of the House. I did not need to defend our President. What I did do that morning was preach the gospel to reflect on the God of Psalm 23, the promises of Jesus, and the hope of the resurrection. In our gospel reading for today, St. Mark provides a flashback to the death of John the Baptist. Herod Antipas, the ruler in Galilee, had detained John for the sake of Herodias. With, without going into too much detail, Herodias and Herod's incestuous marriage was also an unlawful Jewish union due to their divorces. As John was so apt to do, he preached a message of repentance to anyone, regardless of social status. It was for this reason that John had been seized, bound, and imprisoned. This was also why Herodias grudgingly convinced Herod to behead John. Although Herod feared John the Baptist, knowing that he was a righteous and a holy man, even though Herod was greatly perplexed, he still heard John gladly. And yet when the time came to do the right thing, Herod was manipulated into a spineless decision. Not wanting to disappoint his guests, he acted with contempt and killed an innocent man. But now some time has passed, and Jesus has called and sent out the twelve two by two and gave them authority to preach, to cast out demons, and to anoint the sick for healing. They are to depend on nothing other than the authority of God's word. They take no bread, no bag, no money, and prepare for acceptance and rejection. As they went about doing the work of Jesus, Herod Antipas heard of it. The work of Jesus' disciples reached his palace and sent chills up his spine. Herod was fearful fearful that God had enacted a poetic justice. Had John the Baptist been raised from the dead to continue these miraculous works of power? With these week's political headlines, one could contrast Herod's guilty conscience with the seemingly self-righteous antics of today's political leaders. Don't worry, I'm not going to go there. But what I cannot get over in this text, the verses that continue to haunt me as your pastor, as a leader of the community of Christians, as a called and sent disciple of Jesus Christ, why is it that the works of Jesus' disciples catch the attention of the powerful in the halls first, in the first place? Mark tells us they cast out demons, anointing with oil many who were sick and healed them. And King Herod heard of it. 
for Jesus' name had become known. The disciples of Jesus were acting so radically, they were behaving so counterculturally that the palace was notified. I wonder if the same can still be said of the Church of Jesus Christ in the United States today. And what about us? What is the Christian witness of Holy Cross Church in the divided world in which we live? Dear people of God, I'm not asking you to disengage from political involvement. It was actually the witness of faithful men and women that converted the Roman Empire. It was a Christian conviction that forced the feet of civil rights leaders to march in Selma. And neither do I expect that our church members will give up their opinion and become politically unified. Democracy actually demands disagreement. But we, as Christians, can defend a biblical worldview, and this requires us to actually read and know what the Bible says, not what we want it to say. Furthermore, we cannot slap the name of the Lord onto our political party's platform and pretend that God is only on our side. God so loved the world, John 3.16 says. John won, Jesus won eternal salvation for the whole world. He did not die to make sure that your candidate is in the White House. He died to make sure that you were in his house. He died to ensure that we might share eternity forever. And we're going to blow it. Think about the faith of countless saints who have boldly stood up for a different way in the world. Joseph was surprised that God used evil for good in Genesis 50. Think of the courage of Moses the murderer. He dared to return to the pagan palace in which he was raised and profess the name of the one and only true God. Cyrus, king of Persia, who certainly did not believe in the God of Israel, furthered the mission of God's kingdom by commanding the reconstruction of the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, along with Daniel, continued to pray and practice their religious devotion in spite of the political policies against them in Babylon. John the Baptist knew full well that speaking out against the king would lead to his death, but it didn't stop him from preaching the difficult word of repentance. The disciples of Jesus knew that they could be chased out of town. It had already happened to Jesus, it probably was going to happen to them, and it might even happen to you and to me. They went anyway. And they carried out the kingdom work in spite of politicians. King Herod heard about Jesus and the works of his disciples because they looked so differently and they sounded so different from the political and social norms of their day. Arthur Brooks who spoke at this week's national prayer breakfast said, Jesus calls us to this different life, to think and to live differently. He said it changed the world starting 2,000 years ago, and it is as subversive and counterintuitive today as it was then. It's time for us to put down our phones and to have honest and true conversations with real human beings. We can practice that here at church and live it out in our homes and in the world. Christian love is not insulting those who are different than you on Facebook. It is courageous love, love for others who are different than you. What if we all started to see everyone as a child of God? What a witness that could be. It will threaten the norm. It could cause you harm and suffering and even death. But they will begin to see a different way. 
It's the way of the cross and the way of the empty tomb. St. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. When we confess Christ and congruently live out our faith, politicians and neighbors will take notice. They will see that Christians don't dissolve into the same silly fights as the rest of society. They dare to trust in Jesus Christ. You dare to trust in Jesus Christ that he is your savior and not our political candidates. We are not called to be doomsdayers, but we could be the harbingers of hope. May our faith take hold of everything that we say, what we do, and what we are so that others will see, so that others will take notice and the kingdom and eternity will be richer for it. Thanks be to God. Amen.